Hi, so welcome to um, the end of the beginning. <laughs> so this was your first journey through some topic-based uh, liberal arts topics. And, um, and again, the point of all these topics is for you as a student to take with you some of it. And some of you who are going to be history majors will now have a better understanding how history has affected mathematics because we counted in so many different base systems at one point. Um, and then some of you who will go into, um, you know, communications will and philosophy will love the logic part and the sets part. And so some of the stuff you'll take with you and I hope all of you take away the personal finance. And so this part in this chapter with normal distribution, we put everything together. And so this chapter will be a little more in depth in discussing like how probability and the mean and standard deviation all work together in our world. So the first thing I wanna talk about is us popping popcorn in the microwave or in a, in a um, jiffy pop <laughs> on the stove um, where re recall that popcorn are kernels and they have to reach a certain high temperature in order to pop and so when you put all the popcorn in the same heating um, environment whether it's a pot or the microwave recall that most of those kernels are um, increasing with heat usually at the same rate and so they tend to like one is maybe a smaller kernel that heats up a little faster and you'll hear a pop right but then for the most part you hear a lot of popping in the middle right like so you hear a couple of pops because maybe they were smaller kernels so they weren't as large to have to heat up as fast and so they pop and then pop 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 pop, pop. and then they start popping everywhere right and you're like oh i can smell the popcorn it smells so good <laughs> but then what happens that's right, it tapers off, right? And so then you don't hear popping forever, right? It stops popping because most of the kernels are popped. We hope every single one is. And it tapers off. So think about it. We think about the shape like pop, 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 you know? And it makes this nice bell curve. But popcorn isn't the only one that makes this type of curve. So I want to go ahead and show you um um, a few other um, pieces in our lives that actually have this type of distribution too, this bell curve, right? That we see right here in the middle of our paper. So if I, I just found this website, um, the Galton board, and I just wanted to show you examples of real life um, normal distribution. One of the things that we can relate to is the probability with tossing a coin, right? If we toss heads or tails. So if we toss a um, hundred times, you'll notice the, uh, the number of times we get heads is actually a, takes a normal distribution shape, or we could call it the bell curve. <laughs> Um, the birth weight of newborn babies. So this is 3,226 babies. And, um, when they went ahead and looked at the frequency of the weights, it made this really nice bell curve, right? So, and they showed the histogram as well, but now we're going to go into this, what, the black curve. Notice the average female shoe size, right? Can, so, like, notice that if we took a whole bunch of women and asked their shoe size, it would, and count the frequencies, it would naturally make this bell shape. So there are little things um, in our world that have these bell shapes. The SATs or PSLET score um, also is a big one, blood pressure. Um, and so it's just really, it's great when we can actually recognize it. And if you are, get the opportunity to take statistics and probability, we go in like, oh my gosh, so much more detail. It's so interesting. And sometimes I think students should just take it to like for the value of the course. So, because this normal distribution is interesting. Once you start looking at all the things in our world that actually have this distribution, even for example, our pandemic with COVID-19, we were hoping at one point it would just peak and then taper off, right? And make that bell curve. And it just seemed to like go down, up, down, up, down, up. And so 
Um, you know, so there is a country, I think it's Southeast Africa that actually had this nice bell curve that they did tape or, you know, peak and then taper out. It was a normal distribution. So there are a lot of cool things and applications with normal distribution. What we're going to do in this um, chapter is actually just kind of connect from chapter eight all the way till now, all the dots, like why did I learn about sampling and the mean and median and standard DBY? Why? And we're gonna like do that now and it'll all come together <laughs> full circle. Okay, so just looking at the shape, we're just gonna like just, just aesthetically look at it, right? So it makes a bell curve, it has a peak in the middle and then it's symmetric all the way through. All right, and so then, um, we know that it will be symmetric on each side, right? So, so let me write that out. And the middle is always the peak. Okay, and sometimes we always say, oh, it's part of the bell curve, right? It's kind of like a little phrase, but really it's, the, it's normal distribution. It has a lot to do with data. So then we talk about the center, like why is that middle, we know the middle is that peak, but why does it become that peak? Well, that's because of our central ten, uh, measures of central tendency, um, the mean, median, and mode, right? The center, uh, the measure of center, right? And so what we think about is this whole thing is 100%. So this means that, and that's why I put 50%, right? So what the lower half is a 50% and the upper half is a 50%, right? So we know like 50% of the curve is on the left of this peak and 50% of the curve is on the right of the peak and the whole peak is 100%. The middle is the, has all everything to do with the center as we know. So we have the mean, median, and in mode. The mean, median, and mode are all equal when your data is normally distributed. It's very unrealistic that when you take a bunch of data, like when they took the 3,266 babies of uh, the newborn weights of babies, they, they, they certainly did not get exactly three equal three equal three, right? They got like them for 2.9, 2.889 and then 3.001. They all were very close to that peak. And that's and so we really in the real world with data, we always we always assume approximately equal. They should be relatively pretty close to say that it's approximately normally distributed. If they were to be equal for some reason, then definitely they're identically equal. But th that's kind of like how data works. It's never really exact. It's usually just like, okay, we're just approximating. And that's why we round it so much in chapters nine and 10. Okay, well, where is the center? There is spread. And so the next one is spread. And so how does the spread affect your center? Well, remember the quizzes, the three quizzes that all had the same median and mean of five, but the spreads were all different. Like they were um, zero, one, and five. So just like how the standard deviation and the spread can affect your data, so can it affect your normal distribution. So even though no matter what, here your mean is equal to your median and equal to your mode, no matter what, and you still have 50% on this side and 50% on that side, notice what looks different. Take a moment and look at those three curves. And if you were thinking, I think, the height, it looks like higher on the green. Uh, you're exactly right. They are higher. <laughs> That's exactly how the spread affects the bell curve is that peak. Um, because if you think about it, if you think about a rubber band and you stretch it, right, that you're spread, you're spreading it, right? That means it's going to spread and it's going to even get tighter and lower, right? But if I go like this, it's going to like the rubber band's going to make this little loop, right? And it's like going to be very flexible and it doesn't have it doesn't have any spread right that's exactly what standard deviation does to your bell curve so if you spread the rubber band it's going to like psh, squish it down and so here the farther you spread it the more lower it will become and tight right same with the red curve notice here with the red curve that standard deviation is seven and that's the largest of the three 
and therefore that's you're stretch spreading it larger therefore the peak is lower the normal distribution you see the standard deviation of four so that was the middle one it did lower it and then the smallest standard deviation will have the highest peak because it has hardly any spread so the spread will determine how high and low your peak is but again, your, your center is about where that middle lies, right? And if the mean and median are approximately equal, then we can assume the normal distribution. Okay, so with this comes a lot. So now what we're gonna discuss is the empirical rule. And empirical it is because these are percentages that are guaranteed to have your data lie within. For example, the 68, 95, 99, 7 rule are percentages. And they're percentages of which two values your data could lie. Now, it doesn't seem like a big deal if we have a small number of data. If we have 10 data, we could see, okay, about 70% of my data is around here, right? But what if you are a sociology major and you're in graduate school and you're taking data of 3,000 newborn babies' weights, are you gonna line them up and, and calculate 3,000 on a big wall? And no, you're not, right? But if you could just make a general statement to your thesis advisor and say, you know, I did find that 68, about 68% of newborn babies lie within these two weights, right? Seven is eight ounces or something. So um, that's what this guarantees. You can go anywhere in the world and the empirical rule holds. These are percentages, they're not units. So it doesn't matter what country we're in or what part of the world we're in. It's always 68%, 95, and 99.7 belongs with the empirical rule. So when we talk about the empirical rule, it's synonymous with those percentages. And we use the mean and standard deviation to calculate these values in which the, our data lies within these percentages. So just taking a look at this empirical rule picture, we would see that here, 68%, and I'm just gonna zoom in, uh, temporarily so we can see it really close up like that. So we can see that 68% of our data lies within one standard deviation of our mean. So we literally took our mean and just add and subtracted a standard deviation away and we got it. And recall that that's the give or take, right? The mean is the give or take. The Maria's artichokes weighed an average of blah, grams, give or take this, right? Well, we can give or take twice, right? So 95% of our data lies within two standard deviation of our mean. So I would literally take the mean, add two, subtract two, and get those tick marks. Then we know 99.7% lies within three standard deviations of our mean, right? And once again, you take the mean, add three standard deviations, subtract three standard deviations. So the first thing I would do is just go ahead and just find the mean first and then find the standard deviation, add it once, twice, three, get those tick marks, subtract once, twice, three, get those tick marks. I want to make a very important note here. The methods never change, but data, data does, right? You could be doing weights of babies, you could be doing weights of artichokes, you could do heights of women or the number of shoes that women, uh, heights of women, number of shoes that men have, um, the weights of 10 year old um, young children. Uh, I don't know, I, what else was there? There was so many, right? Popcorn kernels popping. There's so many pieces of data in the world. We could do data on anything basically. So these tick marks will change according to your data. So your mean will always be different because it's your data is different for every scenario. Your standard deviation will be different with the mean because every standard deviation and mean and data is different. But the bell curve never changes. You still have the bell curve and you still have the empirical rule. No matter what, if you know that your data makes this bell curve, then you know that 68% of your data will lie within these two values. You know, 95% lies within these two values and almost 100%, right? 99.7 lies between these. So some students are like, well, that's almost 100%. Why would I know? I'm like, well, if it works in your favor, like almost 100% of people love Z pizza. So we should all go easy pizza, right? <laughs> 
So sometimes it works in, in your favor. Okay, so let me go ahead and zoom out and I'll go ahead and write those notes here. So one thing is data changes. So the data changes, which means that your X axis or your horizontal axis will change according to your data. Okay. The second piece is the percentages will never change. Those are fixed. All you're changing is that horizontal axis and get the mean from your data, center division, add three, subtract three, you're done, right? And now you have all the percentages and the intervals. Okay, so again, you'll need the mean and the, and the um, standard deviation to be able to determine the x-axis. But other than that, it's a really simple calculation on your calculator or even if you don't even need it, if the numbers are nice. So with this comes like a whole bunch of other information. And so I like, I, I go ahead and I love to copy and paste this bell curve here. And I encourage you to tab this page in your notes because here is the mean. And remember that one standard deviation away was 68%. Well, 34 plus 34 is 68 because each bell, each, half of the bell curve is 50%, we could split these percentages up like even further. So here for the first standard deviation away from the mean, we have 68%, but because it's symmetric, we know that right here is 34 and 34. Again, percentages never change, just the x-axis. So two standard deviations away is a 95%. So if I added these percentages here, that would equal 95%. However, I know that from the first standard deviation to the second, it's only 13.5% because from the first standard deviation to the mean, it's 34%. And if you add these up, that's half of 95. So we're, we know from the first standard deviation to the second, it's 13.5 on one side, then it has to be on the other because it's symmetric which leaves for the 99.7% from here to here, if you count all these percentages, that equals 99.7%. But if we just look from the second standard deviation to the third, that's only 2.35% and same over here because of symmetry. But remember that it's only 99.7. There's still 0.3% that's unaccounted for in these tails. So 0.3 divided by two, I put 0.15. So in the little tails is only 0.15%. So that would be 0 0.0015 if I converted it into a um, decimal, right? Okay, so I just wanna emphasize once again that percentages never change, just this x-axis according to your data. Okay, and we're gonna use this a lot. When we talk about the empirical rule, Alilia, we're gonna like copy and paste that and just change all the tick marks on the x-axis. Okay, so let's go ahead and visit an example. We have the prices of the peanut butter jars listed above from example 915, and that's from chapter nine. And the, we found the standard deviation to be 26 cents and the mean to be $3.68. Let's find the prices of peanut butter that lie within one, two, and three standard deviations from the mean and interpret your answers in context of the empirical rule. I'm gonna go ahead and copy and paste this piece here. And so I went ahead and just copy and pasted that piece. And I encourage you if you have an iPad to crop it and copy and paste it, or just draw it every time. Um, because again, remember that here is the mean, let me do it in red, the mean, and all we have to do is add one standard deviation here and subtract one standard deviation, add two standard deviations here and subtract two standard deviations here, and then add three standard deviations here and subtract three standard deviations here. So if I do know that my mean is $3.68 and my standard deviation is 26 cents, I can easily find each of these tick marks. So let me put 3.68 in the middle and I'm gonna go ahead and add 
one standard deviation. And I'm just gonna use my calculator here, 368, and I'll add one of my standard deviations, which is 26 cents. And that's 394, so I'll put it here. And then I'll just subtract it. So let me go ahead and I'm gonna just highlight it, hit enter and edit this to be minus. And I'm gonna do this for all of them as you'll see. So 342. And let me go ahead now and I'll continue the subtraction and then put at the end of 0.26, since multiplication becomes before subtraction in order of operations, I'll just hit times two here. So 316. All right, and then the third one, um, let me go ahead and highlight this. I know, huh? You're like, Darlene's so lazy. <laughs> but I love this calculator because I can just go copy paste stuff. So, so here's 290. And let's go ahead and finish the right side now. So I did get one standard deviation, so let me add two standard deviations. And I'm just gonna go up once again and highlight this one and add a times two at the end and get 420. And then highlight it one more time and put times three. So again, once we're what we're doing here, I just want to reemphasize that we're just taking our mean and adding and subtracting standard deviations away. I am subtracting one, two, and three, and adding one, two, and three. And then this becomes our x-axis. Notice that once again, percentages never change, just the data does, right? So our data was different. It was peanut butter jars and therefore we use peanut butter prices of the jars, right? And so then I just added the 26 cents three times, subtracted it 26 cents each time, and then I got these tick marks. Now let's go ahead, um, and we found all of them. Now we can interpret our answers. So um, I don't think we have to interpret all. I think we get the idea after the first one. So let's say here, okay, it's green, so let me do green. So here is one standard deviation away. So this means that 68% of peanut butter prices, jar prices, cost between three dollars and 42 cents and three dollars and 94 cents okay and so i could write basically this is the same um interpretation with all of them because if i did now and erased this and this and this right now i would write instead of 68%, my next percentage is 95%, right? And so here I could see I have two standard deviations from the mean. Oops, there we go. And these uh, add up to be, let me go ahead and do the highlighter, right? So it's from here, 95%. So therefore, I would say 95% 90 of peanut butter jar prices cost between $3.16 and $4.20. And so if I wanted to do 99.7%, um, let me erase this the prices because that will change now let me do red so now I counted three standard deviations from the mean and that is this entire piece which is 99.7 so notice I drew that too far sorry about that notice um I didn't 
include the tails, right? Because it's not 100%, it's 99.7%. So I would say 99.7% of peanut butter jar prices cost between $2.90 and $4.46. So I want you to notice the, pri the actual prices of peanut butter jars. If I scroll up a little bit here, I see that the peanut butter jar prices are between $3.29 and $3.99. Notice that here, even in two standard deviations away, lies all my data, right? And then 99.7, of course, did as well. One standard deviation didn't because the lowest is $3.42, which wouldn't include the $3.29. So we, if you notice, $3.16 was below the $3.29 and the $4.20 was above the $3.99. So actually, in our small data set of five prices of peanut butter jars, 100% of them lied within the 95% rule. And so some students are like, well, this is wrong. And I was like, oh, no, 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 no. I, I, you have just proven that it is right. Because what if I didn't just have five peanut butter jar prices? What if I had 100,000 of them? Am I going to know which is the smallest and the largest or which is 95% or is it? No, right? The empirical rule says don't worry about the 100. If, as long as you just calculate the mean and standard deviation, we can find where about 95% of the prices lie between. Don't look through every single price of 100,000 prices of peanut butter jar because I'm sure there's more out there. So um, again, we do small data sets in the class, but you have to think in the real world, there's like millions of pieces of data, millions of prices of peanut butter jars all over the world. You're not gonna look through all of them to see which is between the 68% or 95%. But if you calculate the mean real quickly with technology and standard deviation, you say, hey man, 95% of peanut butter jar prices are between $3.16 and $4.20. And so, um, this allows you to look at much larger data sets in a quick way of assessing your data. Okay.